Okay, I think we're just about ready to start. Welcome, um, everyone, to this our first community um, lecture days. Um, we have Father Seraphim and Aldea with with us today um, to um, start us off. Um, I'll just say a few words about um, Father Seraphim by way of introduction. Um, I know some of you are familiar with him, um, but others others uh, don't know him at all. Um, uh, but I'm sure you'll find you'll find that he's a lovely man um, and you'll learn more about him about what he does um, um, in, in the course of today Father Seraphim was um, tonsured a monk in 2005 in, in Romania at a monastery in the north of Romania but m more recently he's, he's been involved in academic work um, and also he has done um, a lot of missionary work for a, a monastery that he's um, trying to establish um, in, in the north of Scotland. But his PhD work was in um, modern theology. He has a PhD from the University of Durham um, on a thesis um, about Archimandrite Sophronis um, ecclesiology. So I think we're in very good hands today because the topic of today's lecture is Father, Father Sophron. Currently, um, Father Seraphim is a postdoctoral research fellow at the School of Theology, University of Oxford. And he is, as I said, working to found the first Orthodox monastery in the Hebrides in over a um, millennium. The monastery um, will be entitled the Orthodox Monastery of Old Celtic Saints. Um, there is a website for the monastery. It's called malmonastery.com. It's very easy to remember. I do encourage you to visit the website, see the work that Father Seraphim is doing, um, see pictures from the island, um, see the progress that the, um, the project has made, and hopefully if you can help um, establish the monastery, that would be wonderful. If you can spread the word and get other people involved, I think that would also be a worthwhile endeavor. Um, without delaying any further, um, Father Seraphim today will talk to us again about Father Sofroni um, Saharov. Over to you, Father. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Um, it's the first time I've been here. I, I've, I've never been here before. So I didn't really know what to expect. I haven't met most of you, and I haven't met anybody who is hopefully watching us today via the internet. Um, and not knowing what to expect makes it very difficult to know how to deliver a lecture. If you don't know if, uh, you know, the people in front of you are academic students, theological students, or uh, members of the local community, and you don't really know what they know, it's very difficult to aim it properly. Um, and very easy to f just miss. So uh, what I've decided to do is to cover all possibilities. And um, I've, I've split um, my conversation with you about Father Sophronia today in two halves. Um, we'll begin with this first half, uh, which will be awfully, terribly boring. I will read most of it. Um, it's based around the notes I've taken at the time of my PhD um, and it's supposed to offer you a bit of a structured introduction into Father Sofroni, who the man was, um, how he wrote, what terms are um, frequently encountered in his work, how he uses them, what are the main ideas of his theology, so that sort of thing. It will be boring and I've chosen to do this in the morning because we still have coffee around. And it's, the risk of people falling asleep is greater in the second half, so I've decided not to do that then. In the second half, um, there's another danger, the danger of me having nothing written down. And what I want to do in that second half is talk to you about my father Sophroni, <coughs> which will not be academically uh, challenging, but I believe it will be more interesting on a human, personal, and hopefully spiritual level. Um, I am personally more interested in that type of discussion, but because this is 
uh, a theological institute, uh, I, I believe we should also address the first half. So um, I need plenty of water as I speak. My voice is very weak. There's nothing I can do about it. <clears throat> so please forgive me. Now, <clears throat> I shan't sp spend much time on Father Sophroni's uh, biography, simply because if you want to read um, dates, just go on Wikipedia and you'll find them. I'm not here to reproduce things you can find online or in any, any book you pick up on Father Sophroni. Um, I'm here to give you just one or two ideas about his biography, which I, be I believe are very important and are not at all highlighted in his biography. Now, although Father Sophroni's biography is relatively known today, I do need to give you some brief notes on his biography. The general line of his life is well documented in the writings of some of the members of the monastic community he founded in Essex in the late uh, 60s, of late 50s of last century. The most detailed biography remains that of Father Nicholas, which is included in his PhD, um, I Love, Therefore I Am. Archimand writes uh, Zacharias, also includes a short biography in his doctoral thesis, and a series of other biographical details appear in the introductions to various new editions or translations of Father Sophroni's books. Uh, you can find also interviews or clergy retreats given by people like Father Nicholas or Father Zacharias, members of the community in Essex, um, or collected memories about Father Sophroni. But it needs to be understood that to date, the monastery in Tolishan Nights remains the main source of information regarding his life, which is, <coughs> I assume, natural since he spent there over 30 years of his life. <clears throat> I would point out, though, that nevertheless, the personal relationship between him and those reconstructing his life for the wider public leads to a perceived lack of transparency regarding the information available, both in terms of biography and bibliography. And I'm saying that because um, I'm convinced, as most of the people who work on Father Sophroni's the theology are, that there is <coughs> more information, more material, which has not yet been published. It's not my purpose here today to offer you a complete version of his biography, nor to correct the additions or omissions of those which already exist. There are, however, a few biographical observations which should be made for a more balanced and perhaps critical view both of the elder and of his writings. Now, <clears throat> today, Father Sophroni is known in the Orthodox world as a Russian monastic and theologian, the disciple of St. Siloan the Atenite, and the editor, this is very important, of the saint's writings. It is also fairly known, but not as widely as um, his relationship with, Father, with Saint Siluan, that Father Sophroni was a painter before he joined the Russian monastery of Saint Pantelemon on Athos. Um, <clears throat> and it is also known relatively well that he attended the Theological Institute of Saint Serge in Paris. Perhaps his most celebrated biographical detail is that he is the founder and he was the spiritual leader of the Orthodox mo uh, Monastery of St. John the Baptist in Essex, where he lived until the end of his life. <clears throat> the one thing I want to emphasize is the importance of this part of his life, his life as a painter, before he left Paris for Athos in 1925-1926. Um, and I believe this is important because, in turn, this will offer us a more a critical evaluation of the complicated relationship he had, Father Sophroni had, with Father Sergius Bulgakov and the relationship between their theological writings. The biographical presentations we have today of Father Sophroni easily discard the ears of his life prior to his arrival in Paris in 1923. And yet, by that time, he was already a 30-year-old man with a deep spiritual experience and deep theological convic convictions strong enough to make him give up 
his past artistic career and join a monastery. Before he left Russia <clears throat> in 1921, Father Sofronio was a painter. He lived the life of a painter. He met the people in that environment. He read and exposed himself to the artistic debates of his time. When he left Russia, he again became part of a large Russian community of artists in exile. His art was the center of his life during that period, as he himself witnesses in his autobiographical notes. <coughs> as an artist, he visited the major cities of, of Europe, he immersed himself in the quests and debates of the time, and he continued to paint and to exhibit even after he settled in Paris. It is in Paris at this time that he gave up his oriental mysticism, he was very attracted to that for some time, and he returned to orthodoxy following an experience of the divine light. And shortly after his conversion, he joined the first generation of students of the newly founded Institute of Saint Serge, where he met some of the best orthodox theologian, uh, theologians of the 20th century. One of these theologians was Father Sergius Bulgakov. Father Sergius Bulgakov, who also became his spiritual, his father confessor, and would influence his theological vision for the rest of his life. And one of the things that need to be understood is that Father Sofroni must have known, must have met, or at least known by reputation, Father Sergius long before their meeting at the Institute uh, in Paris. Father Bulgakov's growing reputation <clears throat> as one of the most original and most creative theologians must have preceded him. And this becomes evident once we take into account the extreme impact some of the publications published by Father Sergius in the first two decades of the 20th century had on theology and the major contemporary artists active at the time. I won't go into the details, but there, there's a fascinating account of the <coughs> influence Father um, uh, Sergius had on people like uh, Malevich and uh, Kandinsky and other, other Russian artists. <coughs> the extent of the interest taken by the artistic env environment in the theological writings of people like Father Sergius Bulgakov was extraordinary and was a very rare phenomenon. More than anything, it was a sign of those years, of their common quest for what was authentically Russian, a sort of an experience of freedom from the old dualist choice between either being for or against Western Europe. The difference between this generation and their predecessors is best expressed by the fact that 50 years before, Russian artists had been fascinated with anything Western, anything European, whereas now they were themselves invading the cultural life in the West with their own original music, painting, dance. On, one only has to think of the influence of uh, the Ballet Russe on Western Europe to, to, to realize the difference that had taken place in less than 50 years. <clears throat> at a time when most Russian thinkers were still torn between the old Western versus Slavophile options, there were some, in particular Father Sergius Bulgakov, Berdyaev, Florensky, who were just as strikingly authentic and original in their thinking as the artists themselves. And this common quest for authenticity accounts this permanent interest that the theologian held in art and also justifies the strong relevance their writings had for the artists themselves. <clears throat> Russian art and theology were very much intertwined at the end of the 19th century when many members of the Russian <coughs> intelligentsia were returning to the Orthodox Church almost as a part of Russian Renaissance. This relationship between theology and art continued well into the following century. As a professional and passionate artist, and as a member of the elite of Russian intelligentsia, Father Sofroni must have been aware who Father Sergius Bulgakov was and of his writings. 
long before their meeting at San Serge, as one can see from Father Sofroni's autobiographical notes on his art and the manner in which he understands his art. The influence of people like Father Sergius Bulgakov is obvious. As Father Sofroni's focus shifted from art to theology, and this happened in Paris under the spiritual leadership of Father Sergius Bulgakov, Father Sergius was his confessor and the only person who could appreciate the way in which the two fields, art and theology, can interact. As a side, um, we shouldn't forget that Father Sergius was also the confessor of another Russian artist, a celebrated poet at the time, whom we know today as uh, Saint Maria Skaptsova. It is impossible to imagine that people like Franz Marc or Malevich or Kandinsky, Bakst or Picasso or Matisse, to, to name just a few of the painters and the whole artistic world spinning around Sergei Diaghilev and the Ballet Russe, that they all knew of Father Bulgakov's writings and recognized his influence on their art while denying that a painter as spiritually inclined and Russian as Father Sofroni had the same knowledge. What I try to emphasize is simply that Father Sofroni did not approach Father Bulgakov simply as one of the many theologians who happened to be in Paris at the time. Father Bulgakov's cult reputation in the artistic circles in the artistic circles, must have prepared the way for this encounter and for the spiritual relationship between the two. And it is essential, I believe, to understand that Father Bulgakov's influence upon Father Sofroni's thought didn't start at San Serge, but a long time before that. Why is it important, just on, on a more human, uh, personal level? It's important because we, and I believe we can all recognize this as a process, our lives and our way of thinking are not really the sum of the people and influences we encounter in our lives. It is very important who we meet first, because the person we meet after that first person, we receive that person and his influence through the lens of the first one. You don't simply add up the people you meet in your life and you don't simply add up the things you've read and experienced and imagine that this is who I am. And if I've spent 10 years with one and one year with the other, it means that the influence, you know, that's not how you count, how you count or uh, assess influence. Usually it is the first ones who stick with you for your whole life. And this is very important to understand for Father Sofroni and Father Sergius as well. We also know, <coughs> and this could be the last note on this um, biographical point, we also know that Father Sofroni took part in the youth movement of the early 20s, which makes the meetings between the two theologians, I would say, almost certain by the time he ended up in Paris. Because indeed, Father Sergius was one of the founders and the president of the youth movement. He gave some of the most influential lectures there, and he was the spiritual father of most, of most of its members. We also know that there was a strong link between the newly established institute in Paris and the Christian movement of Russian students. And indeed, the idea of the institute came during one of the first meetings of the Christian movement. We also know that all the students who, offer, who were offered a place for the first academic year at the Institute, and this first generation included Father Sofroni, were members of the Christian movement. All of them must have known Father, Sof Father Sergius from the previous meetings of the movement and must have been at least vaguely familiar with his theology. And to conclude this, I'm just going to prophesy that it is highly possible that there is a correspondence and that a correspondence, be this correspondence between Father Sofroni and Father Sergius will be published in the years to come. I have no proof of it. <clears throat> However, I find it impossible to believe that Father Sofroni would keep in touch with 
quite a large number of people while he was on Athos, member of the St. Pantelimon Monastery, but he would not keep in touch with his old spiritual father. That to me, from, a pers from the perspective of a monastic, is impossible. If, if they have been kept, if they haven't been destroyed, these letters exist somewhere, and one day we'll be fortunate enough to read them. I think I'll stop there, um, because everything else, as I said, is easily available everywhere, in any book, any introduction, just search Wikipedia and it's there. Um, simply retain this movement born in Russia and formed in Russia, went to Western Europe to continue his interest in arts. Arts turned into theology very much under the umbrella of uh, Saint Serge, the Institute of Saint Serge in Paris. Then he moved to Athos at the, mon the Russian monastery there. He returned to Paris in the late 40s, I think in 1947, either for health reasons or in order to publish uh, St. Siloan's writings. And from Paris, he ended up uh, moving to Essex in order to establish the monastery, which we know today as the monastery of St. John the Baptist. This is, this is more or less the geographical movement of, of his life. Now, <clears throat> in any introduction, you speak about the person's life for a bit, and then you're supposed to approach his theology. With Father Sofroni, there are, there are a few aspects I believe are important. On the one hand, we have to think about the way he writes, because he doesn't really believe in writing, and yet he does it. He doesn't really believe in academic training, and yet he encourages the members of his monastery to have one. And that creates all sorts of tensions, which one needs to understand before really approaching his, his writings. After we look at the way in which he writes, after we look at the how, there are a number of, of words, of concepts, which one encounters again and again in his writings, and we should spend some time looking at those as well. Now, about his writing style. Um, The manner in which Father Sophroni writes theology is very strictly con connected with what he calls an um, existential knowledge. For him, existential knowledge can simply be reduced to the idea that in order to know anything, you have to experience it. So in order to write anything, you really have to live it. You can't write something simply uh, out of secondary sources. You, if you want to, to to write theology, you must be a theologian, which means you must encounter God. Um, proper theology, he says, comes when we are introduced into the very act of the divine being. Compare that with the idea of just sticking in a university for three to four years and finishing a PhD. He writes, our existential union with the God of love presupposes the harmonious unity of two wills, God's and man's, and such union takes place in a state of love. God, the personal spirit, and man as a person are joined in one in the eternal act of divine life. Thus do we come to know God, and thus do we come to the point when we can afford to write theology. Knowledge, therefore, for Father Sofroni, is an act of personal, personal revelation from God, a mutual openness between God and man. Being personal by nature, existential knowledge cannot be learned from books, tradition, or even the scriptures. In order to acquire this sort of knowledge, all one has to do is to meet someone who has already experienced the things you want to experience. And there are three levels of impossibility of writing about God that Father Sofroni goes through. 
very often he complains about the limits of his own language and his own ability to express in words the impressions left upon him by his living experiences. Secondly, at other times, this personal handicap is generalized. So it's no longer a matter of a personal inability, but an expression of a universal inability of a created mind, a created language, to contain and describe uncreated realities. This does not refer only to writing itself, but to any manner of expression, including his art as a painter. He writes, God surpasses all human thought. Not one single of our abstract conceptions is applicable to God. When I was a painter, I never achieved satisfaction, because the means at my disposal were impotent to port portray the beauty of creation. And now all the words that I can find to express my wonder before God are quite useless. In some cases, systematic thinking is seen not only as an inability, but even as something alien to the living experience of God. So it's not only a matter of him not having the words, the ability to express something. It's not only a matter of our, cre our created minds and our created concepts and language being unable to express the uncreated realities. It's also detrimental in some way because he says the thinking which is proper to mathematicians and of God cannot express experience of God life of God and this is a quotation is not appropriate for systematization and the same unsystematic approach reflects on his uh, autobiographic auto biographical notes, where he often warns the reader, do not expect an orderly, a properly constructed account of the life of my soul. He simply prefers to use analogies, metaphors, um, extensive quotes from the New Testament. He sometimes, I mean, when I say quotes from the New Testament, I don't mean he quotes a line or a verse. He quotes one whole chapter or two whole chapters, which he introduces in his writings. What holds these various independent bits and pieces, texts, together is Father Sophroni's coherent and always consistent vision, his theological vision. Um, it, it is visible in all of his essays and compensates for this lack of a more systematic style of writing. I think that's pretty much what I wanted you to understand about the way he writes, because that does create tensions. And as I said, just imagine the difference of approach, the way one writes, when one believes, as he writes, that what he does is impossible. When you do something knowing that it is, it is impossible, when you do something that is almost detrimental to your aim, you have an entirely different internal attitude than when you do something that has become a job, which is the case with all academic writers. It, it, it's no longer a person, there's no struggle inside anymore. It doesn't come from the inside, actually, anymore. It's all up here, and there is a system of generating material in an academic way. Father Sophroni would never, ever write anything like this. He did, he did try once or twice while he was in Paris, and he was working with Vladimir Lovsky for the messenger of the Russian Patriarchate. He did try to write two articles, and those are more structured and more academic-like, but he clearly didn't enjoy it because he never attempted it once he escaped Paris again. Um, and it is important to, to, to see this as you approach him. Otherwise, you, you, you will want something that you will not get. <laughs> um, in terms of terminology, there are two things you will encounter again and again in his writings. The, uh, 
the idea of hypostasis and the idea of sobor or sabor um, and all the derivated or derived, however you pronounce that, derived terms that come from these uh, concepts. In his work, Father Sofroni makes abundant use of several technical terms, and most of these are common among all the Russian theologians working at the beginning of the 20th century, and thus reflects the common theological interests which ca captured their attention at the time. Anthropology, the idea of what is man, and ecclesiology, what is humanity, what is the church, were the main topics during the first decades of last century. And so the terms like hypostasis and sabor were particularly common in the writings of these theologians. What I want to do in the next five, ten minutes is to simply introduce you to these terms in the way in which Father Sofroni uses them. And as you approach his writings, if you haven't re uh, uh, read him already, which I seriously doubt anybody properly orthodox hasn't, but um, as you approach his writings, you, you, you must understand how he uses them and the connections between them. Each of these terms, once again, <coughs> hypostasis and everything derived, hypostaticity, hypostatical principle, the principle of the hypostasis, or sobor, and everything that he derives from that, sobornicity, sobornic principle, and all sorts of other names, they are all common, and you'll find them in the writings of almost all the Russians, all the Russian theologians active at the time. This unity, however, at the beginning of last century, is limited only on the level of language, Rather than reflecting a unity of thought as well, this uh, terminological similarity hides a variety of meanings, many times almost um, opposing each other, contradicting each other. This almost blandness of their vocabulary can be explained through a number of factors, like um, the fact that they share a common ethnicity. Uh, they are all Russian. Um, the common linguistic impact of the existential uh, philosophy on their work, and the fact that they all share the same themes, the same topics. I would also propose that um, this final reason is partly explained, again, by the influence Father Sergius Bulgakov had on those writing at the time, because regardless of their personal attitude towards his work, most of these theologians responded to Father uh, Sergius's theology by developing the same subjects and using the same terms. It's logical. I mean, if you think about it, if you read something and you agree to it, you continue and you develop whatever you've encountered in the writings. If you read something and you don't agree to it, you write against it, but you're caught nevertheless. The themes, the topics, have already been given to you and you respond to that and therefore your language, your terms are going to be the same terms, the same language as the person you respond to. One of these terms, as I said, is that of person or hypostasis, which I think is perhaps Father Sophroni's most frequently used concept. He borrows the term hypostasis from the early Christological debates and he applies it uh, in an anthropological sort of way. He takes something that is about Christ and applies it to human beings. In general terms, Father Sofroni uses hypostasis <coughs> to refer to the ontological state of a being that has fully actualized its nature. And very frequently, this is opposed with the idea um, or the state of an individual. And this is something I've learned um, uh, from Father Andrew Louth, that the distinction in this way between person or hypostasis and individual is another thing that was uh, created, developed for the first time by Father Sergius Bulgakov, and then picked up by almost everyone writing at the time. Uh -huh. 
Despite the frequent <coughs> recurrence of the term hypostasis, he offers no precise definition of its understanding. Instead, he prefers to refer to alternative ideas, such as uh, hypostatical principle or personal principle, hypostaticity. And although they appear to be synonymous, the, the two concepts carry different meanings for Father Sophroni. While hypostasis denotes an ontological state of existence, the personal principle or personhood refers to a process. It's almost as if hypostasis is the destination of a process. And because the destination is a mystery, it goes on again and again about the fact that being a hypostasis, being a person, remains a mystery. The process of us becoming a, a hypostasis um, is not a mystery, and therefore we can write about it, we can contemplate it. The same difference appears between his two main ecclesiological terms, sabor and sabornost, or soborni principle. Now, sabor is a, um, is a Russian word, and it means several things. Uh, particularly church and council, uh, as in synod. And most probably it comes from the verb sabirat, which is to, um, <laughs> to gather together, to uh, gather various distinct in, uh, parts into one and make them one. Soborny is, in fact, the <coughs> Slavonic translation for Catholic, um, as, as, as it appears in the Russian creed, where we say that we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. The Russians believe in one holy uh, Soborny uh, church. Over the course of Russian history, the idea of, so the idea of Sobornicity went through a number of profound transformations, both of meaning and of terminology so that in a few centuries only, the concept evolved from an ethnic idea, that of being Slav, Slavic or Russian, into a social, nationalistic one, and ultimately, in the early 20th century, Sobornost became the ontological concept we find in the works of Father Sergius Bulgakov and Nicolas Berdyaev. So it went from ethnic to nationalist, political, social, ontological. The same idea of bringing various things into a unity. Father Sofroni collects most of these variations of meaning and applies them to a wide range of ideas, as I said, such as nationalism, even monasticism, which I believe is quite original, uh, psychology, panhumanism, and especially ecclesiology, when he talks about the church. <coughs> Each of these meanings of the concept of Sabornost and their respective use in Father Sofroni's work um, can be developed into a talk of its own. Um, and it, it would be quite a fascinating one. So we've looked at who Father Sofroni was. We looked at the way he relates to writing theology and what that means for him on a personal level. And we've looked at two of the most frequently used concepts um, or words one finds in his writings. Now, <coughs> maybe for the next 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I want to talk about the main ideas of his theology. And once again, bear in mind what we've said before, because he's not a theological, academic theo um, theologian. You must, you must get an intuition of his vision before you can select the two, three main ideas. He writes mostly about um, ascetical, monastic topics like repentance and living in a monastery and things like that. And his um, talks to the community, his sermons, are almost exclusively dedicated to these subjects. But the way he writes about them and the ideas he, his, he hides 
behind these ascetical concepts are, are very deep and purely theological. Um, and I think his theology can be reduced to a series of questions that all concern humanity. Basically, there are three main things. What does it mean to be human? So, who am I? Who am I as a person? What is the relationship I have with other human beings? What is my relationship with you? with people in the church, with people outside the church, with people who have died, with people who have not been born yet. And that <coughs> leads to his writings about the meaning of the church. And the third one, what is the relationship between me as a human being and God? Um, and to me, that's the most interesting aspect of his theology and to some extent the least developed uh, because that's where ultimately the influence of Father Sergius Bulgakov and sophiology is visible. But there are these three main questions. Who am I? Who are we? And what is the relationship between us and God? So when you draw the line, Father Sophonis' theology can be described as a sort of um, an investigation of relationships which define what it is to be human. And he develops this theology of relationships by building on three fundamental ideas which I hope to look briefly at uh, in, in over the next few minutes. Um, an original implication of St. Gregory Palamas' distinction between essence and energy, which allows him to make the same distinction on the human level, a creative use of the doctrine of creation according to the divine image, which then creates a series of correlations between these modes of existence on the divine and the human levels respectively, and a Christological thinking which allows Father Sophroni to apply on the human level, anthropologically, all the dogmatic statements we know we have concerning Christ's humanity. So let's look at that first, at Christ and Christology. What strikes me most um, in, in the way Father Sophroni uses Christ or in Christology is that this is of cent central importance more as a tool, as a methodology rather than a subject in itself. Christ's central importance for Father Sophroni in his writings is not expressed through an investigation or development of theology of Christ per se but through an investigation of his person as, and this is a quotation, measure of all things and foundation of all knowledge concerning both God and man. Father Sophroni's final purpose, by means of Christological investigation, is not so much to understand something about Christ, but instead to understand something about humanity, through Christ's person and what that person reveals about the human being. So to put this in a more simple, maybe more clear way, although Christ is present everywhere in his writings, he doesn't develop a proper Christological theology because his interest is not to find out or to understand something about Christ. He takes that from uh, patristic authors. He uses Christ as a tool, as a method, to understand something about who I am, who we are, and what that relationship between us and God is. So Christ in Father Sophroni's hands is not so much a subject in itself as it is a tool, something he operates with. Father Sophroni sees Christ as a point of intersection of a complex system 
of relationships um, on the divine level, on the human level, and between God and man. And as such, Christ is not key, is not key to a specific Christological question, but to anthropological, ecclesiological, and sociological ones. What do I want to say by that? And that's what I'll develop a bit further now. I want to say that Father Sophroni looks at Christ and he sees, well, he sees many things, but he, you can, if you want to, by force, you can categorize what he sees. He looks at Christ and he sees a set of relationships within the divine being, within the Trinity. It is through Christ that we are being revealed something about the Trinity. The relationships of the Trinity within the Trinity are revealed to us through Christ. And that's one level of, these, of this theology of relationships. Another level is that it is in Christ that we also are revealed the same relationships between us. So the same, um, it's almost like mirrored, a reflection. What we see of the Trinity through Christ, we also see in humanity. And that's another level of relationships. And thirdly, it's also in Christ, in his divine human person, that we see the relationship, the intersection, the, the way in which the human being and the divine being interact. So you have the same well, concept, Christ, describing Trinitarian relationships, ecclesiological relationships, and the way in which they merge into being one. I wonder where I should pick this up now. I only want to talk for about 10 more minutes so that we have about 20 minutes of hopefully questions because if not I can always find stuff to bore you with <laughs> um, because I'm, re I'm re I really the idea again was to give you some sort of insight or tools for you to go away and approach Father Sophroni on this level, if this is your thing. The idea of the second half, hopefully, will be to give you a spark of love <coughs> in Father Sophroni, so that you can approach him on that level, if that is your thing. And I personally hope that that is your thing. Mm. Um, okay. I think... I think I'll look at the most difficult one because I, I mean it, it will be the most confusing but it's the most interesting to me which is uh, these inter-essential relationships the, the relationship between God and humanity Father Sophroni makes use of a creative reading of the doctrine of creation according to the image in order to project the intra-essential relationships within the divine trinity on the level of humanity. This is something new. This is something Father Sophroni does in common with or continuing something uh, started by Father Sergius. The idea of being created according to the image of God is very common and has been used extensively in, in the first millennium and since. But the way Father Sergius and especially Father Sophroni uses it is to say that everything we are being revealed through Christ can be projected and affirmed about humanity. And this is something new. In other words, if, if we derive a definition of a person 
based on Christ and the relationships between the divine persons in the Trinity, the same definition can then be applied on the human level and we end up with the church. This Trinitarian one tree hypostatic divine being becomes the structural model for the one multi hypostatic human being. Now, once this intra essential within the same essence structural similarity has been established, Father Sophroni moves on to identify in Christ's divine human hypostasis the prototype for the inter-essential, that meaning between essences, relationships. So the prototype for the relationships between the divine being and the human being. Yeah. And after describing what it means for humanity that Christ is one of the Trinity, he moves on to tell us what it means that Christ is both God and man. The fact that both natures subsist in Christ makes him the perfect revelation of the report which exists or pre-exists between these two essences, the divine essence and the human essence. And by means of implication, this relationship between the two natures will show us, will clarify something of the report between God and man. Now, to continue this, it becomes necessary to look briefly at what Father Sophroni, at one of Father Sophroni's most creative interpretations of, of, of this idea of uh, divine image. Having used the same doctrine of being created in the divine image to justify the soborne structure of the human being, and thus to talk about the church, Father Sophroni makes use of the same doctrine to support his vision of the relationship between God and man. Follow, following St. Gregory Palamas, Father Sophroni distinguishes between three modes, I'm sorry, three modes. He sometimes calls them modes, other times moments, other times uh, poles of existence of the divine being. The moment of essence, the moment of energy, the moment of hypostasis. This threefold structure of the divine being, he then projects on the level of humanity. So that he goes on to distinguish between human essence, human energy, and human hypostasis. And thus humanity itself is structured according to these three modes, moments, or poles. Now, it should be noted and just as an aside, that unlike the divine moments of existence, these human modes of existence are very difficult to argue for on the basis of patristic theology. This is not to say that Father Sophroni's opinion and writings contradict in any way uh, the patristic uh, uh, doctrines and theology, but it is almost impossible to find the interpretation this particular interpretation of the divine image anywhere else except anywhere else before him except maybe Father Sergius Bulgakov and his sociology. Father Gregory Palamas himself only applied this threefold structure to the divine being while making no similar statements regarding humanity. Of course his theology can be used to support this parallel but you cannot say necessarily that it implies it. The closest to have done the same, to use the same interpretation of the doctrine of creation, is once again Father Sergius Bulgakov and the parallel he develops between divine energies or divine Sophia and human energies. Although Father Sergius does write about human energy long before him, Father Sophroni is the first one to clearly formulate this original distinction between three moments in humanity which mirror the three moments of the divine being. And thus he writes that the church, as the whole Adam, humanity, has one nature 
a multitude of hypostases and one energy. And this energetic moment, or pole, however you want to call it, is the key to these inter-essential relationships between... It, it's this moment of energy which is essential if you want to understand how and to what extent God and man interact. I think I'll actually, beca because I only want to speak for one hour and I've got three more minutes to go, um, I'll, just, I'll just present this uh, <coughs> simply in, in, in my own words so that we end, we, we are on time. I like to be on time. Um, so we've got, we've got Father Sophroni using the doctrine of creation according to the divine image. And he uses it in a very original way by reflecting the three modes of existence identified by St. Gregory Palamas in the divine being, in the human being. Obviously, persons or hypo the hypostasis is not the point of intersection between God and man, except in Christ. There is also the dogma of separating, forever distinguishing between the divine essence and the human essence. The way in which the human being and the divine being become one is by joining in the moment of energy is by living, as Father Sophroni says, the same life. Or, this is a very simplistic way of putting it, but I do believe in this parallel, by the unity between the divine Sophia and the human Sophia, which we find in Father Sergius Bulgakov. I think the extraordinary thing about Father Sophroni as a theologian is not so much his originality, not even perhaps his depth, because there are others contemporary with him who have written more and perhaps better. But he's unique from what I know in joining together praxis, the actual life of a Christian monk and theology. It's almost as if he is the one who has taken this theology, went with it at the very center of orthodox monasticism, lived there for over 20 years, and came back to re-deliver it from a completely different perspective and in a more approachable way. And it is my belief that it is through Father Sophroni that in the next few decades um, Father Sergius Bulgakov will, will, will come back in uh, the proper uh, orthodox theological debate. It's almost as if Father Sophroni is the gate through which his old father confessor will be regained for orthodox theology. I have no idea if any of these made any sense to you, um, but it did do what I wanted to do, which is just give you an introduction of a certain type for a certain kind of mind. If there are any questions, glory be to God. If not, coffee. <laughs>